we're talking about being no longer children and, and our focus for, for this spring quarter uh, is to grow uh, as, as adults for us to step up and, and take responsibility and, and mature for, uh, for our own relationship's sake and, and for the kingdom of God's sake. Sometimes um, in life, people have to kind of pull you along. Uh, sometimes you pull your children along, you know? Time to go, let's go. And you're, you know, you got a hold of their hand and dragging them out because they're, they're not quite ready. And uh, sometimes God does that to us in the kingdom. He just pulls us along. But uh, at this particular time, it's as if he's saying, okay, I'm, I'm dropping this responsibility on your shoulders for you to grow, for you to step up, for you to take responsibility for your own maturity and your own growth. Uh, and so that's what we're talking about here is the different ways that the Bible says that we can grow in different strategies and different ideas and in different areas uh, that we can grow. So our key verse that we've been looking at uh, each and every week, we're drawing it from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 through 15. And Paul's writing to Christian people here at the church in Ephesus, and uh, he's, he's really the whole chapter is about their individual part in the whole body of, of Christ. And so it, it applies to all of us. Picking up with verse 12. He writes, for the perfecting of the saints, that's you and I, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man or a perfect human, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's our goal. That's our bullseye. We want to become like Christ. And, and we're not going to do that unless we're growing, unless we're intentionally doing things to become more like him. He goes on to say that we henceforth be no more children. All right, it's time to stop acting like a child. It's time to grow up. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So that's the goal here, is that we can grow up into Jesus. Mm -hmm. These lessons aren't designed to say anybody is, you know, behind uh, where they should be or, you know, shame on you, you're not doing it good enough or fast enough. Not at all. <laughs> it's just a, a focus and a directive where God is saying, all right, it's time, to, it's time to move forward a little bit because I've got greater things for you. Uh, it's time to move up a little bit higher because I've got more things for you to experience. And so that's that's the the desire here. Several key words that uh, are, are the focus are, that can help us uh, understand, okay, what is it the Lord is, is trying to say? Of course, the main key word is to grow uh, in all we're doing for God. We always want to be growing and moving in, in one direction. God often looks at our lives not as though we're just uh, static, but we're either becoming more like him or becoming less like him. There's really not ever any middle ground. Mm -hmm. So so growth. Another key word is, is the D word. Remember the D word? Discipline. Discipline. Uh, nothing really good or valuable in life comes without hard work. And so God will talk to us a lot about being disciplined. Self-mastery. Reigning in yourself and, 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 and being disciplined in the Christian disciplines. Reading the word of God. Praying. Giving. Uh, all of those things, the, the very core uh, of who we are. So, so discipline makes all the difference in the world. You don't have people with, of successful businesses that are not disciplined. You don't have world champion athletes that aren't disciplined. Neither do you have uh, people who are powerful with God without discipline getting them there. Another key word is change. Um, how many of us like to change? Well, we like the results of change. But the process of change, oh, that's, that's, that's a little uncomfortable sometimes, right? That's a little difficult. I remember growing pains as a boy um, where my muscles would just hurt. <coughs> Why? Because I, I was growing. And, and there's, there's a little difficulty involved with change. But, oh, it's so worth it. Whatever, whatever changes we can make uh, to make us a better person and more like God are so, so worth it. Um, so grow, discipline, change. Uh, and, and the last key word will uh, undergird all that we're talking about is to, to rise up, to take action, to, to put it into practice. 
And that's why we have Sunday school. And that's why we have the opportunity to engage with God's word so we can learn, God, how can I take this with me? And when I leave the church on Sunday, put it into practice on the other six days of my life um, so that I'm growing. That's the, that's the goal. So today's lesson three, we're going to talk about doing justly. Uh, but before we focus on that, um, let's do a little review of, of the, first, the first two lessons. Our, our very first lesson, when we kicked all this off, we talked about the importance of growth. And if you're not growing, something is wrong. You know, that's true biologically. And we mentioned different uh, growth syndromes or diseases that, you know, if your child isn't growing, that's a very serious matter. Like it's not just, a, oh, they're just little. No, there's serious ramifications if they're not growing and developing. And so the same is true in the kingdom of God. We want to always be growing. We want to always become more like God. I'll let you in on a little secret. If you didn't already know it, you're never going to be perfect mm -hmm. down here. Right. You're never going to reach everything you want to be until you get to heaven. Now, don't let that discourage you from trying and from advancing. But the point of it is, what I'm trying to say is, we're always growing. Even the retired pastor of 50 years who's seen it all and gone through it all and dealt with it all can still be growing in his relationship with God until he meets the Lord in heaven. So if you're not growing, something is wrong. Growth is so very important. We shared a Chinese proverb in the very first lesson that said, be not afraid of growing slowly, be afraid only of standing still. And we mentioned that. We don't want to be stagnant. We don't want to be still like the Dead Sea, we want to be free. And the goal, of course, we want to grow up into Christ, into God. Our second lesson was where, where this takes place the most in us, and it's, it's right between our ears, up here in our mind, our brain. And we talked about in lesson two, a change in your brain that we need to renew our mind. And what do we renew our mind with? The Word of God, absolutely. That's why we read it on a daily basis. Never discount what you're doing uh, on a daily basis, a daily individual basis. That's where true and real and strong growth comes from. We talked about the fact that, you know, some people can advance so rapidly, so quickly. Uh, and, and if there's not a foundation underneath them to sustain them, there might be problems at that point, right? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome Good to morning. Sunday School. Hi, how are you? So glad to have you this morning. And so we tried to stress the importance of not just reaching for the big moments only, but what are the things you can do on a daily basis to just continually grow stronger and stronger and stronger? I mean, think about it. If you wanted to make your body strong, would you lift weights every day? Or would you just go crazy and lift a ton of weights on Saturdays only? Which would be better for your body? Every well, day, yeah. that everyday work, right? And so trying to grow in God is the same way. Um, not to say you can't have and won't have major moments you weren't expecting. I mean, God gives us those moments and we should pursue those moments. But if that's the only way you live, it's going to be unhealthy and it's going to be disappointing. Because you need a daily regimen of in encouraging your mind in the word of God. That's how you grow strong. Right. That's how you're really going to have something lasting that's going to, going to carry you through. Um, and so we mentioned in that lesson the words of Jesus that he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you're going to ask what you will and you shall have it. He stressed the importance of making sure we keep God's words in us. And how do we do that? Well, through our brain, through engaging and renewing our mind. Growth is a choice that's made right here. Mm -hmm. There'll be a lot of obstacles you'll face everywhere else, but ultimately it comes down to right here is where you determine uh, that, that you are going to grow. So today we're going we're gonna to move into a, a, a portion of scripture that we'll spend about three lessons on. Uh, and so we'll be looking at the Old Testament prophet, the Meyer prophet, named Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, uh, is what we're going to focus on uh, today and for the next two lessons. And, and that is this, to, to do justly. One way that we can grow and show evidence that we're becoming more like Jesus Christ 
is to do justly. So let's go to Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. So verse 8 there is the focus of what we're looking at here. He, he lays out a, um, a yearning of, God, how can I please you? God, how can I worship you? What is it that you want me to do? Do I, do I bring burnt offerings? Do I bring calves and rams and, and rivers of oil? Do I bring my firstborn? What do I do? And the Lord answers and he says, um, he's shown you, O man or O mankind, what is good and what the Lord requires. So this today is what God requires of you. This is what the Lord is saying. I'm requiring this of you. And he says three things. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. That's kind of life in a nutshell of what God wants us to be and to do. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's what God requires of you. So today we're going to examine what it means to do justly. Now, all of us, with any, with any word, any vocabulary word, often we, we can think of that word in a certain way that's based on um, our past experiences, what we've been taught, all sorts of things like that. So it's really good when you're, when you're studying a word or you're trying to understand what it means, especially from the Bible, uh, to do a, a, a little study, a little tip that I have for you is, is to understand the word um, in its original language. What does it mean in its original language? So, you know, the Bible, in, in many cases, in the Old Testament especially, used vocabulary and language in Hebrew that is thousands of years old. And so a meaning that they said in their time might be different than a meaning we have in our time, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I don't have to give you examples. I think you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. so, so it's really good, and I, and I just want to share this tip so it'll, it'll help you when you study and read on your own. It's good when you come across a word um, to look up what that word means mm -hmm. in the original language. And it's very easy to do. You can search it uh, on, on the internet, or you can use tools like a concordance or something like that. Um, but understand what the word means in its original language, but then also look it up in, in our own English language so you kind of have a, a good understanding of, of what the, the concept is that they're talking about. Um, because otherwise, you know, um, we may take on our meaning of the word and that may not be the original context of what, what the word means. So, so it's good to look into some different ways that we can uncover what does this word mean. So we're talking about doing justly, justly. Um, the word justly from, uh, from the Hebrew means... Um, properly a verdict, whether favorable or unfavorable. Um, it's pronounced judicially, especially a sentence or a formal decree, whether a human or divine law. So I got in my mind the image of, of a courtroom and a judge administering justice, administering a verdict, administering a formal decree, whether it's God giving his divine decree or, or natural man giving their, their natural law decree um, is kind of the, the idea of what justice or justly means. So in short, it means obeying the law, both God's law and man's law, when he's saying here to do justly. Uh, that's what God expects us. He expects us to follow his commandments, to follow his word, to follow his law, but also to follow the law of the land. If we look up justly in the uh, modern dictionary, uh, three meanings. To do justly is to is according to what is morally right or fair. So what's morally right or fair? And I think you have these on your study guide. Uh, the second definition is, is in a just manner, honestly, fairly. Um, if we were to do a business transaction, you would expect me to do it justly, fairly. You know, I'm gonna sell this item to you for um, $800 and 
You know, we want to do that transaction above board, fairly, honestly, right, justly. Uh, a third definition is in conformity to a fact or a rule accurately. So Mike is telling us, God is telling us through Micah, I want you to do justly. I want you to do what's morally right. I want you to do what's fair. I want you to do it honestly. I want you to do it accurately, all in a way that's going to honor God. Check this out. Isaiah 61 and verse 8 says this, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. That's pretty strong words from the Lord. He says, I love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. In other words, when we're coming to worship, God loves when things are done justly and right. He doesn't want us to do things wrong, uh, to, to rob in our way of worshiping or living. He went on to say in this verse, I will direct their work in truth and will make with them an everlasting covenant. He loves justice. He's going to direct us in the way that is true and that is right. And so that's, that's part of our focus on God. How can I grow? I can grow in you by doing what I know is right, according to your word and according to the law of my land, to pursue what is fair, honest, accurate, and right. So if I could break it down for us today, um, how are some ways that we can do justly? Uh, because I, I can't just say, okay, do justly, close your Bibles, Best wishes with it. But how can we expound on it a little bit? You know, what are some ways that we can that we can look at here from the word that help us understand how we can do justly and and in, in so doing be able to advance, get more like God and and grow. So so I bring five different things that perhaps God requires. There uh, certainly could be more, uh, and maybe there's things more pertinent to your specific situation than, than what I'm speaking, um, but nevertheless, these, these will help us. Mm -hmm. So one way that we can do justly is to put plainly what we tell our kids, make right decisions. When it comes down to it, make the right choice. Make a right decision for you and for yours. If, if you're just living solo, Make the right decisions for you. If you are responsible for other people, uh, for a family, for children, whatever, make decisions that are right for all of you. That's what God is, is requiring of his people. Uh, make right decisions by obeying, of course, the divine law, God's word. Uh, we've got to know it in order to obey it. And so if we're unfamiliar, God, what do you want me to do? Well, get parked in a Bible study. Continue to be a part of, of teaching and preaching uh, at church, read it for yourself and, and become aware in prayer. God, how can I honor your word? Teach me it so I can walk in it. Um, we want to make right decisions according to the Bible. And, and God is such a, he's such a perfect and wonderful father because he rarely grows impatient with us mm -hmm. and he never chastises us for, for the effect of making us feel bad when we're not quite measuring up. But he is that perfect father, that perfect coach that will lead us and direct us and guide us and, and help us to know how we can better obey him and obey his word. He, he's in your corner. He's rooting for you. He's, he's more for you than you are for yourself. And so you, you've not only got this personal responsibility that's resting on your shoulders, but you have the almighty God um, helping you along, guiding you along because you're, you're not in this alone. So so we want to make right decisions according to his word, and, and God is for us, and he is helping us to make that happen. We, we need to make right decisions uh, regarding the, the civil laws of our land. Um, to be put, frankly, don't do things that are going to get you in jail. <laughs> don't do things that are going to ruin your reputation in the community. You know, you want to you want to obey and make right decisions in 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 the civil law as well. Mm -hmm. You want to be an upstanding citizen. You have a witness of of God in your life. And so everything you do, as far as your decisions, um, they need to be in the right direction uh, because it's it's a way that that you can honor God. Jesus taught, you know, to obey uh, both God and Caesar. There are certain elements that we do to be in line with our local government, our state government, our national government. Um, and there are things we do, of course, to stay in line and in truth with, with the King of Kings, God's government. And so uh, God expects us to operate in that way. 
Now, if there's ever a time, of course, this goes without saying, that a civil law violates God's law, well, which law do we lean with? We lean with God's law. Right. We do what God directed us to do. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, he's got our back. Um, so making right decisions is one thing that, that God requires of us. And this is illustrated well in Psalm 37, verses 27 through 29. Just listen. Here's what he says. This is how you can, uh, this is how you can do good. Depart from evil and do good. Pretty, pretty good way to say it there. Just go away from evil, do good goes on to say and dwell forevermore for the lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints they are preserved forever god's got our backs forever when we pursue his ways but he goes on to say but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off we have no guarantee of anything good if we make decisions continually that are wrong and that are contrary to god right. those are going to be cut off from god but he says, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. You've got great promises mm -hmm. when you choose to obey God, obey his word, uh, and, and strive to do the right thing. And, and when you come up short, thank God for the blood. Right. Thank God for his mercy that is new every morning. Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about here is taking responsibility, putting a little gumption into our own spirit and saying, God, this is what I want to try to pursue with everything that's within me. I want to make right decisions. I want to do good. I want to honor and obey your word. A second area that we can, uh, we can do justly, um, and this is so pertinent for our cultural day and time, uh, is not taking unfair advantage of others. God expects us to not take unfair advantage of others. And it's highlighted very, very much in our society, um, unfortunately, that uh, whenever someone is uh, taken advantage of or they're disadvantaged, it's everywhere. It's out there. You know, I was called this, I was told that, and it, it's just, it's all over the place. And um, unfortunately, that makes it, that makes it difficult um, when there's all these voices that are constantly crying, you know, I've, uh, I've been taken advantage of and, and this and that. And, and, and that's not how God wants us to live. We, we are expected by our Father not to take unfair advantage of anybody, not to use anybody for our own personal gain, um, and so on. We see it all throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament law, God was very clear how they were to treat each other, how they were to treat strangers, uh, how they were to treat their fellow brethren, but even people they never knew. God was very precise that um, he didn't want his people taking advantage of anybody for any reason. And of course, that was only... Um, increased in the New Testament through Jesus's law of love. He went beyond the, the, the law of Moses, the, the Old Testament literal law, and he said, we're writing this law in your hearts that you can love others as yourself. And, and that's, a, that's an even greater, um, even greater way for us to, to treat others like we would want to be treated. Um, and and that's, that's the, very, the very heart of God. In the book of Levit Leviticus, uh, God highlights this, chapter 19, verses 15 through 19, um, and, and he's very clear. Leviticus is um, the book in the Old Testament where God is laying out his law, the religious law, the ceremonial law, the moral law. He, he, the whole book's about that, um, and, and he, he speaks it here in, in this 19th chapter. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor honor the person of the mighty. So in other words, you know, don't discard this person because they don't have a lot of money, but yet really honor this person because they do. God's saying, don't, don't be like that. Um, in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. When you are dealing with your neighbor, who is my neighbor? Well, anybody in my world, anybody in my sphere of influence. Um, deal with them in righteousness. He says, you shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Don't take advantage of somebody. Don't go and, and, and speak ill of them or, or spread rumors for things you don't fully know or have all full knowledge of, um, because that's taking advantage of somebody. Uh, and, and so he goes on, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, 
You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You shall keep my statutes. So you need to not take advantage of others, but think of it as being like Jesus. There were so many people he could have taken advantage of for his own personal gain, but he never did. He always stooped to a lower place to help people, to lift other people up, to bless them and make them better. Um, and so that's countercultural to the way of our, of our culture right now. Right now, if, if, if somebody does something you don't agree with, you have every right to go tear down their reputation and say what you can so they can lose their job and all that sort of stuff. That's how, that's how the world is treating each other. But that's not, of course, how the body of Christ treats each other. We don't take advantage uh, of, of anybody, but we strive to be like Jesus. How can I bless this person? How can I lift up this person? How can I help them? Uh, that, is, um, that is not taking advantage of others. A third way that um, we can do justly is to uh, forgive and to show compassion. And we've, we've, we've heard a lot about that from our Wednesday Wisdom series and some of our Sunday preaching um, about the power of, of forgiveness uh, and, and showing compassion. Uh, Zechariah 7.9 uh, says it pretty, pretty plainly. Thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. We need to be quicker to forgive than we are to um, tear someone down. We need to be quicker to offer compassion than we are to only focus on, on our own personal needs. And um, a lot's been taught about that, so I don't have to, to stay on this topic for very long. But, but that's a way when you're growing and advancing in God, Surely some of you have, have noticed this and uh, you've seen it in your own life from uh, maybe your, your before Jesus days or your old days. Um, you know, maybe you weren't a very forgiving person. Maybe you weren't a very compassionate person. But now, look where the Lord's brought you, how, how that's all changed, how that's all turned. Um, and so when, when you can forgive and when you can show compassion, that takes maturity. I mean, that's not an easy thing for the flesh to do. Uh, it's not an easy thing for someone who's brand new and serving God to do. And so that's definitely on your way toward the, the measure of the stature of Christ when, when you can forgive and you can show compassion. Um, and, and I'm grateful that God is giving us a lot of opportunities and, and knowledge and focus right now uh, to, to get better at doing that. Um, I want to get better at that. Right. I, I want to be able to forgive you so that I know you will forgive me. Uh, and it's just a, a better way of habitating in peace that way, you know. <laughs> uh, a fourth way that we can we can do justly um, is to to value the individual. At the very beginning of the year, um, Pastor brought that out to us that um, Jesus valued individuals, and yeah, he came to save the world, the billions and billions of people. But yet he, he would push everything else aside. He would even go miles out of his way to meet with one person. And isn't that true for your story? Mm -hmm. Isn't it true when you first met God that nothing else around you at that moment mattered? You knew God came and he met me right here, right now. Um, and, he, and he changed everything. Jesus' example shows us so beautifully of how, how we need to value the individual. And, and when you have value for someone, when you understand their importance, when, when you're dealing with them through a spirit of compassion, you're going to do them right. You're going to do them justly. You're going to do the right thing for them. You know, I mean, maybe this is a bad example. I don't know. But if the president of Russia walked through that door, some of us would have some pretty strong feelings and we want to do some things to that man. You know, I mean, I would. Right. You know, I, man, if I could stop what's happening in Europe by taking care of that one man, you know, oh, I'd want to do it. But then I need to be like Christ. Mm -hmm. I need to realize he's an individual. How would Jesus respond to President Putin? What is it that Jesus is wanting to do in him and through him? So to value the individual really helps us do them right and, and do justly in the, in the eyes of God. Because in all actuality, 
the way God has treated us is the way he wants us then to treat everybody else. Right. And there's so many times when I could have walked through the door and God could have said, oh, I'm going to let you have it. But he didn't. He let mercy rain down on me. And, that, and, and we all can say that right. because he showed the value of an individual. Um, and, and that's a way that we can grow when we learn to value every single person, no matter what they say, no matter how vulgar they are, no matter how much they just make you go, oh, you know, that annoying person in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> we, need to, we need to grow in Christian maturity yeah. to try to, to value them because when it's all said and done, they're a soul. And, and there's really no difference between their soul and your soul or my soul. We're all souls. Proverbs 29 and 7. <clears throat> the righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. Mm -hmm. Not just poor with money, but the righteous considers the cause of the poor. The person who, who is um, maybe not the best in society. The person who doesn't have it all together. The person who, who you really don't like. The righteous considers their cause, thinks about with compassion where they are. But the wicked, they don't understand that knowledge. They don't understand that type. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we see our society very much emphasizing that second part of the verse. And a fifth area that we can strive to do justly is to stabilize the world around you, to make a positive contribution to the world around you. Is your little world a better place because you're in it or a worse place because you're in it? Your family, are they better off because you're in the family or are they worse off? Why? Your place of employment, are they better off because you're there or are they worse off, right? We could do it then and now, you know, years ago, my workplace probably was a bad place because I was there, but Jesus changed everything. Right. And now it's a totally different story. Um, as we're doing justly, as we're growing and maturing in the things and the ways of God, the world around us, our little world, ought to become more stable. We ought to be a, a factor of peace and stability. Why? Because it's, it's not you and me specifically, it's Jesus in us. It's right. this word of God that's in us, that, that, that is transforming us, that should make our little world around us a better place to be. And, and if, think about it, if every Christian was living up to their potential in the way that God wanted them to live, every portion of the world would be made better, right. would be stabilized, would be more secure, would be less chaotic because the people of God are in it. And so I know there's a rising spirit of Antichrist all throughout uh, the world and we see the chaos. But at the same time, let's let that spirit of Jesus Christ rise through us as we as we do justly and as we're giving it our very best to grow and become more like him it's going to make everybody in your world better and and isn't that the goal isn't that the desire to to show jesus to others the word lets us know that that you and i are living epistles epistle is a book the small books in the in the back of the old testament um romans and corinthians and ephesians and, and James and Peter, those are all little books, epistles that were written to help us. We are living epistles. We are, we are Jesus to the world around us. And so if we're growing and if we're doing justly, we're going to be, we're going to be making a positive contribution to the world around us. So a few examples that I want to point out before we, before we wrap up. Obviously, when it comes to doing justly, there's no greater example we could look at than Jesus. And we, we mentioned that just a little bit, but think about his life, what you know about his life, what you read or heard um, through the Gospels. Jesus treated every individual fairly. When he was talking to Nicodemus, who was a very powerful leader, he had a lot of influence. Many people looked up to him. He didn't treat Nicodemus any differently uh, than he treated uh, the 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 woman at the well who was married to five different husbands and was an outcast and she couldn't go to the well at the time everybody else did because she wasn't allowed because of her life. He treated, we know, he treated everybody the same. Right. Whether they were good, bad, well-known, not well-known, righteous, sinner, whoever, he treated them justly. Um, and and we, we ought to strive to do the same. I know that's your desire. I know that's your goal. Uh, I'm not saying it's not, but, but that's how we can... We can do justly and grow. Um, Jesus lived a life free of reproach. You could leave 
Jesus at home with the kids and know everything's on the up and up. You know, you, you could leave Jesus in the bank after hours and know there'd be no missing money. You could leave Jesus in any situation and know it was going to be perfect. Uh, maybe that's a little sacrilegious to say it like that, but, but that's the truth. You knew he was going to do everything right. And, and wouldn't that be great for that to become our reputation? These people here, I know they're going to do the right thing. They're going to do what's right because they're striving with everything they have to love and serve God. Uh, and, and that's that's the bullseye. That's the goal. Right. Uh, you know, through Jesus's life, he never gave his followers any reason to doubt that he would do the right thing. We always knew he could be counted on. Um, and, and, and we have the spirit of Jesus living in us. So we are capable to do the same. We're capable to live just like he lived because he's come in us to help us to do that. Um, so if, if you have in your free time, <laughs> um, you can read Matthew chapter 5. I'm not going to go there because it'll take a while. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And in this particular portion, Jesus teaches what we call the Beatitudes, where, where he says, blessed, is the, blessed are the poor and blessed are those who mourn and, and that sort of thing. And, and those are uh, the attitudes of how to be. Um, and, and we'll probably teach on this in a later lesson, so I won't focus too much on it. But each Beatitude that he shared uh, was like a, like a step up in maturity in growth. Uh, and and he, he, he followed up the Beatitudes. The very next thing he preaches on, on the, on the Sermon on the Mount, is to, to be salt and light in the earth. Do you recognize that? Do you remember him talking about that? He says you need to be salt and you need to be light. Well, back when I was a kid, you know, if you were salty, that was a bad thing. <laughs> they would make, you know, oh, he's salty. He's a salty character. Um, but, uh, but to be salt means you you preserve life. Because back in the day, before refrigerators, that was how they preserved meat. They would salt it. They would make it to where it could last. And so if the Christians are taken out of the earth, what hope is there that humanity is going to last? So we're salt. We're salt. We help preserve life. And we are light. We, we know the value, of course, of light. Thank God. <laughs> we really know the value of light today. Uh, when we walked into a dark room, but now, thank God, there's light. Um, we know the value of being light in the world, shining into people's darkness so they can see the Lord. Um, and he says, you are, a, you are a city set on a hill. Israel's a land of hills and valleys. And he was pointing out the fact that if you're a city buried in a valley, nobody can see it. If you're a city that's set on a hill, everybody can see it. What's he trying to say and what am I trying to say? He's putting us as his disciples, as his followers, out there as salt and light and as a city on a hill to be seen. God wants you to be seen. He wants your life to be seen by the world around us. And if we're on display, if we're living epistles, if we are a city set on a hill, then we need to be doing our very best through the Holy Ghost help to do justly because people are watching us. Right. But that's a good thing. That's not something to be afraid of. That's a good thing because they're watching what God is doing in us. Brother Coley, I don't really feel like people are watching me. They are. Mm -hmm. They are. You don't have any idea the full scope of influence that you have. So let me just tell you today, there are eyes watching you. There are people looking at your life. And if you're in here today because you're desiring to grow and become more like God, then I'm confident they have something good to see. They can see Jesus in you. And that's being salt. And that's being light. That's being a city on a hill. So we, we can see so much through Jesus' example. But recently, uh, as our first ladies talked to us um, about James, Jesus' brother, James the Just, as he was called. Um, and, and his example just, it really stuck with me. Uh, maybe it ministered to you as well. But um, she shared with us, I'm just repeating uh, what, what she taught, that the book of James, this epistle, um, which we've got our scripture here from James, um, is a synopsis of Christian maturity. It's just a straightforward little book of how you can grow in your Christian maturity. And James, who was a brother of Jesus, um, he lived the Nazarene vow. Um, he was a man of prayer. He was evidently somebody who grew because, as Sister Wood brought out, uh, he, he wasn't a believer necessarily in Christ as the Messiah, till after his death. So that indicates there was a lot of growing he did 
since then. Mm -hmm. and, and we can be encouraged by that. Um, he grew so much, he advanced so far uh, that he was a man who would pray forgiveness for his people. That, that directive that we've been given to pray, repentance for our nation, repentance for people so it can open the door for resurrection. James did that. Um, and he, he, he wasn't somebody who was vindictive of the injustices of society, but instead he did what we all should do. He took those things to the temple and onto his knees in prayer. And, and that's where he unleashed <coughs> those things before the Lord um, and was, was an extremely prominent and important individual uh, in the church. And so we could look at his life and we could see, okay, James is someone that grew. He didn't start out knowing everything and having it all just right, but he needed to grow. He needed to advance. But boy, did he ever. He advanced in such a way that history has shared with us that when he was martyred, when he was pushed off, when he was beaten with the club, that he prayed forgiveness for those very people who were taking his life. And um, that's, that's maturity. That is not easy to do, right? If someone came in here and started clubbing us to death, you know, would our natural response be, I forgive you? You know, that's maturity. And so that's a goal for us to reach. And we can find that encouragement through, through Jesus and through James. So it's very fitting, therefore, that James would tell us, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty profound and powerful statement coming from a man who definitely proved it, who definitely lived it out. If anybody could say those words, he could say it. And so I mirror those words today, that if we know to do good and we don't do it, it's a sin. It's not living justly. But rather, let's do the good that we know God wants us to do. Um, we obviously, I don't have to expound on this very long because we're all living in it. We all live in an unjust world. There's things happening every day in America, across the nations, that are extremely unjust. And it's always been that way. I mean, from creation, it was unjust for Eve to take the fruit and disobey God. It was unjust for, for Cain to slay his brother Abel. And from then on, all the way to right now today, humankind has always been acting unjustly. Um, and and so we, we're in it. We hear it, we see it, we're a part of it all the time. But I finish with this. As Christians, as the apostolic church, we should be a stabilizing force in an unjust and an unfair world. We should be the ones helping bring stability to a nation and a world that's in chaos. And if you're not directly involved in doing it, you can do it on your knees. You can develop camel knees by by bringing stabilization through prayer um, to, to an unjust world. In short, we can do justly when we do right by God and we do right by others. And that's our challenge for this class and for this particular time is to, is to do justly. Do justly to those who treat you well and do justly to those who do not treat you well. Because God said it very plainly in Micah, he showed us, O church, O UPT, O adult class, what is good and what does the Lord require of you and of me, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. So I hope you're encouraged to do justly, um, to just do the right thing. And uh, with the Lord's help, I believe that you can. So let's pray and talk to Jesus about that for just a minute. Lord, we're so grateful that you would speak to us, that you would bring to us the word and a challenge today to be like you, to do justly, to do good and to do right. And God, we can accomplish no good thing without your help, without your spirit leading us, guiding us. And so we just pray, Father, come in and move in our lives. Work in those things inside of us that need to be, that we can be like you, that we can treat those around us with compassion and to do justly as you did justly because we want to grow and we want to honor you. So we thank you for this chance to do so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.